Welcome back, COIQ listeners. On today's episode, we have Dr. Robert Groves with us. He is the Executive Vice President and Chief Medical Officer for Banna Aetna, and I can assure you that we are going to have a very interesting dialogue today about what it's like to innovate within a health system that has at least 28 hospitals, last time I checked, crossing or spanning over six states, and one of the largest employers that we have in the United States. So welcome to the show, Dr. Dr. Groves. Thank you, Roxy. I'm glad to be here. I'm, I'm looking forward to the conversation. So let's just kind of get started, like I do on every episode, by having you introduce yourself. You know, what, what do you do? Um, and um, just tell us a little bit about your background. Sure. Uh, yeah, my uh, training is in pulmonary and critical care medicine, and uh, I practice pulmonary critical care for, gosh, uh, all told, probably 25 years. And uh, in 2013, gave up the direct patient care part of that. Uh, but, you know, at the start of my career, I was a traditional pulmonary critical care guy, seeing, seeing patients in uh, uh, both the hospital setting and in the outpatient setting. And then in, uh, well, you know, my career has had some interesting twists and turns. And uh, about six years into it, I, I, uh, I stopped and uh, tried my hand at a startup company. We were trying to do a voice-to-data technology and did that for a few years, and then wound up uh, joining Banner Health in 2005, initially to roll out a tele-ICU, which we okay. can describe in more detail as, as we uh, get into this, and, and then worked my way uh, through the organization in a variety of roles, became interested in population health, and, and uh, at, uh, uh, at one point became the vice president of, of health management uh, for Banner, and then that evolved into uh, chief medical officer roles in the Banner Health Network, which is the value-based contracting arm. And then that uh, turned in uh, to the role that I have today in a joint venture between Banner, which is a $7 billion integrated healthcare delivery system that started as a hospital system. Yeah. Aetna, which everybody knows the name Aetna, and, and of course now we have a third partner in the mix, uh, because Aetna was recently acquired by CVS. So uh, I, I find myself in an interesting position, uh, poised between uh, these, these two giants. Right, right, yes. Um, and that's one of the things that I think makes this conversation so exciting because in, in my experience, it's a very different world trying to innovate within such a gigantic multi-layered organization versus a startup that's trying to build it, bring a healthcare innovation to market. So, so kind of before we get into the specifics around, you know, the, the healthcare delivery system that you're living in these days, help me understand your perspective on what is it like, um, just describing the healthcare ecosystem through the lens of innovation as a whole. Yeah. What, how would you well, describe what's happening today? Yeah, I, you know, healthcare could be described, and, and this is how my, my colleagues who have spent time in the military uh, have described it, as a target-rich environment. Uh, there is lots of opportunity uh, for improvement in healthcare, and, uh, you know, technology has to play a big role in that. There is just too much uh, information to manage and too much complexity uh, to manage, even with teams of people. And we know healthcare is a team sport. That's been around for a while, but it is becoming uh, almost impossible to manage uh, without uh, the uh, intelligent application of technologies. The, the, the challenge has been that many of the technologies that have been developed for healthcare have developed along the, I'll call them, uh, at least in the United States, natural silos. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, seem to be isolated from other parts of the system. So when you take on, when one, uh, as an entrepreneur, takes on healthcare, I, I think the first thing that uh, you have to decide is what problem are you going to try to solve? And, and once you figure that out, uh, then you can start thinking about what technologies or what strategies uh, might be different or innovative to, to allow uh, you know, to break into that market and, and provide something that nobody else has. Mm -hmm. So how is innovation affecting the system and the network that you live in? Yeah. Um, 
Well, you know, the way I think about it is that uh, healthcare is so badly broken that mm -hmm. I, I think we need transformative innovation. It's not incremental innovation. Incremental innovation is is iterative and it's okay. And you know, we get a little bit better at the current EMRs. We get a little bit better at uh, 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 an interaction uh, among a team, uh, you know, process uh, management, lean type strategies. All of those are okay for fine tuning what we do. Mm -hmm. I think uh, in the space that I'm in, what I'm looking for is strategies that have the opportunity to transform us. Because let's face it, we've been talking about innovation in healthcare for a couple of decades now. And yep the costs continue to go up and we haven't really put a dent in that. I think there are a couple of reasons for that and that, that has to do with why I'm in the position I'm in. Uh, and, and one we've touched on a couple of times is, is just complexity. You know, it, it, uh, it is really, really difficult to get one's arms around the entire beast. Uh, and, and the other reason I think that that happens is uh, there's a tendency for uh, short-sightedness in the commercial market. And mm -hmm. that most of the innovation really has to take place. And, and what I mean by that is in the commercial market, of course, the, the primary customer from an insurer perspective is business, right? It's uh, uh, not necessarily all big business, but that drives a lot of it. And there's those, you know, 100 to 300 uh, uh, employee businesses. And then there's all the small businesses. And those are the guys that are buying the products to deliver to their employees. And they tend to, to see results in a year or two, you know, they want right. to quickly. And I think a lot of insurers end up promising things that simply can't be delivered in that time frame. Mm -hmm. You know, what I have gotten in the habit of doing with uh, buyers, typically businesses is saying, look, if you continue to do what you've always done in that way, then, then we're going to continue to see exactly what's happened over the last couple of decades. Costs are going to continue to go up. What needs to happen, I, I say it is we need patience and patience. Uh, we need the time to develop the strategies, to develop the technologies, implement them, test them, iterate, improve them, uh, to get to that point where we actually have a transformational uh, uh, product that really can bring costs down in a big way. So it's a pick your partners kind of thing. It's, mm -hmm. you know, align yourself with a company that you truly believe is trying to do something different and then support them. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't mean you, you look the other way for, for, uh, you know, bad outcomes, but you support them and you continue to iterate and you watch that foundation being built and pretty soon you'll see the building go up. And, and mm -hmm. that's what I encourage over the last uh, year and a half that I've been with Retina. The, the, other, the final thing I'll say about that, Roxy, is complexity is the name of the game. You have to get comfortable with that. I used to think that I personally knew how to fix healthcare. I mean, I, and when I look at it now, I am, you know, ridiculous because it is simply too massive for any one person to know how to quote, fix it. Mm -hmm. what we believe is that if we get the incentives right, then there are lots and lots of smart people out there who will on balance actually fix this beast and, and give us something that's uh, uh, more uh, beneficial uh, and far less costly than what we have today. There's plenty of room. I think at least 50% of what we do is waste. Yeah. Yep. So, so are we there yet with the, you know, reimbursement models and incentive alignment? And if not, how far do we have to go? Well, I, it, the, the one piece that's hard for uh, individual people or companies to manage really is the government piece, right? I mean, uh, approximately half of uh, the money that flows through healthcare now flows through either Medicaid or Medicare or Veterans Affairs, uh, those, uh, those pocketbooks are the ones that are funding healthcare now. Mm -hmm. and although CMS has been toying with major reform, uh, we haven't yet gotten to the point where fee for the end of fee-for-service is in sight. And I do believe 
that until that happens, we're, we're still going to struggle because, it's, you know, it's not because healthcare providers are any better or any worse than anybody else. It's, it's that at the margin, when the incentive is, uh, you know, uh, if you want to make more, you do more, then at the margin, when there is honest debate about whether you could do another EKG or have another office visit, on the, you know, you're going to do more, uh, typically. Individuals will do more if that incentive is there. And you can fix reduced costs by increasing volume. As long as that's there, it's hard to uh, encourage true innovation. I mean, you, you get punished for doing the right thing, essentially. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I had a conversation with a client just this week um, who's who's not a health system, but we were talking about value-based care and outcomes and kind of shifting to that because there's immense opportunity. They're engaging with patients all day, every day. So there's immense opportunities to start collecting more data and report that back. Um, and there's a cost associated with that. There's an extra layer of cost. And, and so the conversation was, how are we monetizing that? But you right know, now we're not know. getting compensated for it. So we're not doing exactly. it. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Even yeah. though it could be helpful and moving the needle as you know, for the industry as a whole. Yeah. And and I do it's not that I don't think there's anything we can do about that, mm -hmm. right? Because I think there is, because I think there's been enough dialogue about the need for value based care. And you know, one of the points that I make over and over again is you know it's common to hear it's unsustainable. And uh, what we don't hear is that we are currently in crisis. It's not a crisis that's coming. We are currently in crisis. And the evidence for that, it, you know, it's like boiling frog, right? You know, frog jumps into boiling water or jump out if you go slowly. Well, we are boiling the healthcare frog. And the evidence for that is that people are putting off needed care. There are people who are dying because of the cost of healthcare. And I would argue that we have sucked up, we being the healthcare industry writ large, every bit of improved middle class productivity for at least the last two decades. Mm -hmm. Income has been hampered by, uh, what did uh, uh, Berkshire have, the, the tapeworm <laughs> on American business. And so the, the crisis is now, it's not coming. It, and, the, it, and the fact that uh, life expectancy has gone down for the last three years running, I, <clears throat> I think that's directly related to uh, economics, and economics is directly related to the cost of health care. So we're in crisis now. It's not mm -hmm. a future crisis. We're watching it happen. That's what the opioid epidemic is about. Uh, that's what the, the crisis in behavioral health is about. These things are all tied together. And, and so it's, it's no longer, gee, we got to fix this because in the future there's going to be a problem. The problem's now. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So how, so with that context in mind, how, um, how are you creating innovative programs in this very complex, entrenched in tradition and old ways of doing things? How are you yeah. conceptualizing and launching and gaining adoption of innovative programs? Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And uh, the short answer that I'll give you is recognizing opportunities and grabbing them before they disappear. Mm -hmm. and, and that even goes back to the EICU. It was like, oh. Yeah, you know, give us an example. Uh, yeah, I mean, we've, we've got a board of directors at, at Banner Health at the time. This is 2005, so this is early uh, <clears throat> in the process. Uh, that, and, and we've got a, a C-suite, the you know, CEO, COO, everybody C. Uh, that is fully behind this this project, uh, and this was after a full evaluation. I was part of the team uh, that went to Chicago to look at uh, what Advocate was doing with the ICU, and so you know we've got everybody on board, and uh, let's seize the moment and really roll this out and do it aggressively. And so that's what we did back in two thousand five. So what is tele ICU? Let me just describe that to you very quickly. <clears throat> uh, imagine a bunker, if you will, a room uh, that has, uh, uh, you know, board certified intensivists, uh, critical care nurses and administrative support, all sitting at multi-screen computers that are connected audio visually in real time to every intensive care unit bed at Banner, 400 plus, of uh, seven states. Uh, 
uh, imagine that scenario and then imagine a, a software algorithm that is uh, constantly uh, uh, doing surveillance on those streams of data that are coming from the bedside mm -hmm. by adverse trends. And so we, we, that's what tele-ICU is essentially. And so we, we had four duties the way we, we described it to our colleagues is number one, uh, respond to requests for help from the bedside virtually instantly. And, and that's literally true. You can be there with a board certified intensivist and audio visually connected to the room in the blink of an eye. Mm -hmm. uh, thing is is uh, to uh, uh, identify those adverse trends and then intervene before they become adverse outcomes. The computer algorithm helps us do that because computers are much better at identifying those sorts of trends. If I walk by a room and the blood pressure is you know 130 at one point and maybe uh, late in the day I walk by again and it's 90, both of those are kind of normal, so I might not uh, notice. But a computer would notice if that had been sliding all day long and it could send me an alert. So what that allowed mm -hmm. those docs to do is to focus their efforts where they matter, uh, trends that were going wrong. And then the third thing we did was uh, help along with the computer algorithms with rote uh, 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 tasks. You know, everybody needs X or everybody needs Y. And with rare exception, we ought to do this for every patient we see. Making sure those I's are dotted and T's are crossed. Like, deep vein thrombosis prevention or, uh, you know, stress ulcer prevention, those detail things that get missed if in, in the flurry of activity around critically ill folks, unless there's a, a system for making sure that gets done. And then the fourth, obviously, is to measure what we do and, and improve. Um, what made that work was the unwavering commitment of uh, the board of directors and the C-suite, because there was lots of pushback initially. We had folks hanging towels over the camera. Uh, threatening to report me to the state board, all kinds <laughs> of interesting things took place. Sure. Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it was uh, exciting times. Right, right. Uh, what's that? I said, right, exactly. Yeah, Especially right, exactly. in 05, you know, that's really early. Yeah, it, yeah, it was. And, and uh, we didn't have rioting in the streets. I did have certain hecklers who followed me around to every hospital uh, presentation. Uh, uh, but, uh, Ultimately, and, and here's where the patients part came in with the board too. It took four years uh, mm. to uh, get general acceptance. It took four years to prove that there was an ROI on this and it was expensive, uh, but they stayed the course. And today it is the largest and best EICUs in the country. Uh, mortality is, is some 20% lower than predicted. Length of stay is somewhat uh, around the same amount lower than predicted. Uh, and it answers the question, yes, better quality can cost less and significantly less. So that's an example of patience and patience and that uh, uh, taking advantage of an opportunity. Mm -hmm. uh, there are a lot of places where it didn't do so well. The board was split or there wasn't that strong commitment or the hospital start pushing back and saying, this is a lot of money. I could use it over here, over here. And uh, it took all of those things being in place. So I'll give you another example. Okay. Uh, the, uh, in my current role, we had a window of opportunity where uh, the uh, company was considering, gee, what are we going to do about uh, telehealth? And we seized that opportunity and said, okay, let's figure out if we can, you know, as the JV, as the innovation engine, if we can slide something in here, uh, you know, before everybody gets too focused on one of the big players, and get something going. And so we went through a, a process, which is quick by, uh, by large company standards, of about uh, uh, eight weeks of you know, requests for information, uh, you know, comprehensive uh, uh, requests for proposals, narrowed that uh, field down from 15 companies to uh, about uh, seven or eight, and then narrowed that down further to three that we visited on site and looked at what they were doing. And we came up with a great option. And uh, I know you know about these guys because you interviewed them, uh, I think, here recently, and, and that's 98.6. So, and, and that was a partnering opportunity that mm -hmm. we took advantage of. And uh, now we've got that rolling out, in fact, I think next month, if I'm not mistaken. So that's another, you know, it's, it's an opportunity. That window is closed now. I don't think we could do that today uh, because of, you know, CVS acquisition and their relationship with certain uh, telehealth players and Banner's relationship with telehealth players and Banner's interest in building its own. I mean, all of these uh, sure. uh, 
uh, interests uh, are, are challenging to navigate. And so slipping that in is uh, an example of taking advantage of an opportunity. So I'm really curious, you know, a, a lot of our listeners are health innovators who are trying to sell their solutions, their wares to folks like you. And so any, it, it could be those 15 companies that were in the running could be listening today. And so what made 98.6 win that business and stand out from some of these other innovators? Because I think that that's just some lessons learned that our audience can be able to take with them. Yeah, yeah. And, and gosh, there are a couple of things. I could say actually quite a bit about that. But, but let me start with, I have not encountered any other company that came in the door saying, hey, we think primary care ought to be available to everyone and we want to reduce the barriers to, to accessing primary care. And so we're going to try and offer our services at, and I'll quote, a ridiculously low cost. Uh huh. Doesn't happen. I, I, I did not, nobody else. Uh, said that. They said, well, we charge the traditional rate, and we do this, and we do that. And it's like, yeah, I know. That's what everybody says. And that, that was the, you know, that's an attention getter. Gotcha, uh, yep. Mm -hmm. the, the, the only part of it, I, I think that the other big piece of it is you, you have that aha moment when you say, wow, yeah, everybody kind of does communicate via text. And yeah, I do like the fact that I don't have to be interrupted. And, you know, and, and then you mm -hmm. have that, uh, what was palpable about their culture and how much time and attention uh, they spend on taking care of the caregivers. You know, 20% of their doctor's time is devoted to making the system better. They built this. And, right, right. And so, you know, those things, uh, they stand out. They really do. They get your attention. I think that's great. I think it's just great wisdom um, for our listeners. So, so I want to kind of dig deep a little bit into this is when you're developing these innovative programs, um, how are you involving or are you involving providers and patients into that innovation process? Are they ideating solutions to some of these most critical problems that you've got strategic initiatives wrapped around? Help, help me understand what that landscape looks like. Yeah, yeah. They certainly help identify the problem. Uh, you know, for example, um, uh, prior authorization. Nobody loves prior authorization. Uh, you know, uh, patients hate it, uh, doctors hate it, you know, we hate it. Uh, it's just a pain. Uh, to, mm -hmm. And, you know, often when I say that, doctors will say, why don't you just stop doing it? Well, the answer is, is really pretty straightforward. It's that we don't practice evidence-based medicine as a, a whole, healthcare, uh, and physicians, you know, there's too much knowledge. You don't have uh, knowledge management to the degree you needed at the point of care. And so you tend to practice the way you've always practiced. And that leads to wild variation in practice across the country, across counties, and even within the same group. And they mm -hmm. can't be doing it right. You know, right, 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 right. exactly. It's impossible. And so uh, what, you know, in the interest, obviously, of the insurer is to prevent over and over diagnosis, you know, uh, that's their job. And, uh, you know, the, the job of the doctor is to make sure the patient gets what they need. And that's where that, uh, that's where the two meet in prior mm -hmm. operation. And, uh, but if we could get the information to the doc in real time, at the time that they're seeing the patient, so that they knew if I want to get this MRI, the literature, and by the way, it's not the insurance company typically. Now I say typically because all these things are open to interpretation and insurance companies tend to lean to, you know, one way and the mm -hmm. another. But the literature says, if I want to get this MRI, I should try this, this, and this first. And have I done that? And if I haven't, it's going to get denied. So I might as well either one, go ahead and do that or go directly to appear to appear right now, instead of sending off a request, waiting for a week or two until somebody looks at it, and then finding out that it's been denied, and then yeah, you know, this whole process is 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 flawed. Yep, very and so, expensive. 
that's what we're working on today. So, so who identified that problem for us? It's all the people raising their hands saying, I got a problem with this, I got a problem with this. Um, and it's patients, it's docs, it's insurers, and a lot of money is wasted on that process. Mm -hmm. We're talking today to uh, a variety, in fact, we're, we're anybody out there <laughs> has a solution for this. We're just in the process of identifying companies who can help us solve this problem. And it's, it's not easy, right? You've mm -hmm. got to, uh, uh, the ability to look at a chart uh, in a variety of EMRs, and that probably is going to require some AI. And then you've got to have the ability to look at uh, expected clinical practices on the other end and match the two. And, you know, it'd be ideal if it could simply read the chart. Yeah, right. The doc, uh, this ain't going to, you know, pass and here's what you need to do. And by the way, there's one other key issue there. One of the things that's very frustrating as a physician is to have a conversation with the patient, build uh, a trust, uh, order an MRI, and then have an insurance company deny it. And sure. Now, the first thing the doc thinks is, look, I'm the doctor, I know what's best, you will get that MRI, and the patient, you know, gets all huffy because the doctor knows what they're doing, and the insurance company must be to blame, and that's not always the case. I mean, mm -hmm. sometimes it's the doc uh, isn't doing evidence-based medicine, but they've already committed, and they've already committed in, a, in, in an environment of trust, and it's hard to back down from that. Mm -hmm. How different that is, if you know up front, it's like, you know, yeah, we could get an MRI, but let's try this first. And, and once, you know, if the doctor's committing to that, that's a much easier conversation with the patient. You maintain trust, et cetera. So uh, that's an example of how it, we, we are toying with focus group strategies to say, you know, how can we make this better for you? Uh, the other thing that people complain about that we've, we've uh, identified as a huge bear is uh, the EOB, you know, the, the expert. Mm -mm benefits. Oh, uh -huh. That letter that you get for the insurance company that says this is not a bill. And it's like, well, what the heck is it then? You know, and, <laughs> you, know you, you try to figure out what's going on. And, you know, we saved you this much from what, you know, right. you know <laughs> it, it makes no sense that we do that. Nobody understands what it is. Uh, why isn't it like a credit card statement? So, you know, I mean, electronic, much, uh, decipherable. Uh, <clears throat> you'd be amazed at how difficult it is. Man, it's part of it is the claims lag, right? There's that two to three months time that it takes for claims to be processed and cleared. And by the way, I've asked questions about that. And uh, gosh, it's, there are so many things in healthcare that's, well, that's how we do it. You know, so yeah. there's an opportunity for innovation. What if you had instant claims adjudication? Wouldn't that be cool? So there are lots of opportunities for innovation. Sure. It's, sure. uh, you know, the sky's the limit. And, and a lot of this stuff, it's kind of like, you know, Steve Jobs, a lot of this stuff, you don't have to ask anybody. Just look at your own experience. What sucks about healthcare? Well, do you have a solution? <laughs> you know? Right, 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 exactly. Some of it's not rocket science, right? As yeah. far as the discovery of the problem. <laughs> yeah. um, so, so when you're rolling out these innovations, you know, we have, I have a lot of conversations around adoption. And, and so we might get some innovations out there that really solve um, a, a viable, pro an important problem. Um, but there really is just some slow adoption by patients or providers. So how Help us understand what are some of the strategies that you've deployed to help with patient or provider adoption. Is there anything that stands out to you? Yeah, I, I you know, um, I think first of all, you got to have a champion, uh, and whatever it is that uh, I'm trying to get folks to adopt, uh, you know, it, who is the key influencer? Mm -hmm. Category is it nurses? Is it respiratory therapists? Is it doctors? Is it administrators? <clears throat> and then in that group, uh, you're going to need a champion. And, and if you don't have that, then it probably is best uh, to focus somewhere else uh, where you do have that and then let those, you know, later adopters uh, come on board once they see the proof of concept. So that's number one. Uh, without a champion, it can be really, really tough to break into anything in healthcare. Mm -hmm. I think the second part, and, and this is, you know, it's, it's something that I think uh, is intuitive, but I, I ran into in a, in a book I picked up recently that uh, uh, some of you may have read called Loon Shots. I don't know if that rings a bell for you. It's the author's name is Safi Bacall, B-A-H-C-A-L-L. -L. I have not. I'm writing it down. Okay. Loon Shots. Yeah. 
um, he goes through some fascinating stories, uh, you know, about Nokia, about Pan Am, uh, uh, and, and what their trajectory was, and why, after being radical and highly successful innovators, at some point they fall off. And he even goes through a fascinating story of, of uh, both the discovery and eventual implementation of radar in World War II, which probably changed the outcome of the war, as did other, you know, like Einstein's uh, uh, discovery and, and uh, the Manhattan Project, et cetera. But my point is that uh, most great ideas that, you, you, that make it to implementation get killed about three times. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And you watch this, and, it's, uh, and, and so what's needed, actually, in addition to a champion, is somebody within the company that is offering the innovation, who has the patience and the will and the resources to stay the course. Uh, you know, you've got to have a champion on both sides is, is kind of what it comes down to. Mm -hmm. and, and the implementation requires an interaction. And what I mean by that, he separates, uh, Bacall separates out the, uh, the world into the, the, he calls them the soldiers and the artists. And the soldiers are the folks that are using lean process to deliver what we know works reliably time at a critically important part of the process. But you introduce change to those folks and it freaks them out. We got a process. We got this down. What is this? And, and if you can get them to take whatever it is you're offering, they will look at it and they will say, I can't use it. It's, you know, it's this, it's that, or, you know, with radar, it's too heavy. I'm not flying with this in my airplane. It's too hard to look at. Those are valuable. Uh, those are, he calls them false failures. Mm -hmm. Failures because even though those soldiers may say, I can't use this, it's garbage. What they mean is in its current form, this is not as useful to me as it needs to be in order for me to adopt it. Mm -hmm. And so iterative process, there has to be, he, he likens it to uh, phase shifts. You know, when, when, uh, when water goes from liquid to solid, that's a phase shift. And he says, you have to, you have to hold it at 32 degrees where you've got some ice. Those are the soldiers that, and you've got water and those need to exchange on a regular basis to iterate until that innovative product is maximally useful and then it will get implemented. So it's champions on both sides and that concept of having a nursery for that innovation where it can uh, have the opportunity uh, to grow even as uh, people try to kill it. So, so Robert, I mean, I think that that is huge and I wanna kind of sit with this for a little bit because health innovators or even folks like yourself sometimes have the belief where they have to have the perfect solution. And when they, in order to, and if I'm a health innovator, in order to present it to someone like you, I've got to have all the answers. Everything, I got to know what features and functionality you need. I've got to know what problem it's solving. I've got to know the business model. I've got to know all of these different things in order to be credible, in order to, you know, get investment, in order to get buyers. And, and so there's this kind of two parallel paths of, I got to have some semblance of what that's going to look like to raise capital or to get buy-in internal to organizations yeah. like you. I also have to have some semblance of that, how I'm going to package that business model in order to get pilot customers. But at the same time, to your point, I need to make sure that I'm not so absolute in those things because I need to build, test, iterate build, test, iterate. And, yeah. and I think that, I think that as an industry, both, you know, leaders like yourself and health innovators, that it's kind of like, it, it's just, it's very complex to navigate yeah. both of those areas and make peace with it. Yeah. You know, and it's, it's interesting. And I even think that innovators may need to help because there's, uh, educate. There's there's uh, irrational expectations on both sides, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, if you go to a procurement department, well, you know, it's almost like they expect you to have thought of everything and fixed it before you bring it to me, you know? Right, and, right, right. <laughs> uh, and, and so that's an irrational expectation. And on the, you know, and, and, and so it creates that expectation on, on the innovation side. And so I think, here's what I would look for. I would look for 
someone who has thought deeply about you know all of those potential issues uh, who is honest about the ones that they haven't yet quite solved and are looking for interest or support and who are willing uh, to offer a product that is not fossilized it's like yeah we could we could tweak that yeah we could tweak this I, I'll give you an example of that in uh, in our current uh, uh, relationships. Uh, there's there's a company called Holon. Uh, mm -hmm. It's just like the Ken Wilber term, H-O-L-O-N. And uh, uh, they are a smart pipe, is what they call themselves. And, and so... A smart pipe? Smart pipe, yeah. They, okay, they, all they right. They channel information. Uh, uh, the, the story goes bi-directionally. In other words, uh, we can take information from your database and put it in front of docs so they can close care gaps and whatever else. Oh, and by the way, we can do it uh, uh, EMR agnostically. doesn't matter what your EMR is. Oh, and by the way, we can uh, put it in the workflow. So we're not asking wow. for a separate system, et cetera. Okay? Mm -hmm. Cool. Uh, the, implementation of it in, in the implementation of it has been a little more challenging. And, you know, folks get frustrated and, well, it doesn't work. And, and the answer is, oh, yes, it does. It does work. It's not perfected yet. Uh, the, the, the pipe from database to physician works beautifully. And that's, uh, and they've got patented technology for that. What we're all interested in, though, is, wow, if you could have a system that could pull information out of any EMR and send it back to my database, that's way cool. And, and so, you know, we're all interested in that, but that's not an easy task. And it takes some iterations and some, uh, we've watched it work. Um, is it scalable yet? Probably not massively, like the entire chart extraction, but pieces of it, yeah. And, and I can see a day when we get to the point where that's highly valuable. Now, uh, from a business perspective, hold on, rightfully has to ask, how much time and effort do we put into this with the Ankh rule out there, maybe solving this problem for everybody by mandate. Right, right. There are a lot of things that go into that, but my point is that it ain't perfect yet. <laughs> it's valuable and I can see where it's going. I mean, the, you know, it, it, it's kind of like the first automobile uh, or, or, or two out there. It's, it's like, what am I going to do with this? I mean, I, I have to hand crank it. It's unreliable. There's no place to get it serviced. You know, I'll take a horse, thank you. Well, but somebody could see the day when there were, you know, highways and, and, and refueling stations and all of that stuff that, that arguably made our lives much better. So, uh, so it's early and everybody has to do that equation of how much risk am I willing to accept? And the innovator needs to be flexible in, okay, if they're going to help me develop this and they're going to put sweat equity into it, what do they get in return? Uh, so being flexible on how you arrange it and, oh, everybody's interested in whether you'll take risk or not. Now, that may not be appropriate for very early innovators, but at some stage, if you're confident enough to do that, that's huge. Mm hmm so yeah, what so what's the ideal? Because I know our some of our listeners are in that very situation right now, and they're making decisions around that. They're making decisions on what are the terms of their pilot with an entity like yours, yeah. to where there's this balance. Um, you know, I, I I talk about this phenomenon of death by pilot, right? Getting pilot into, purgatory. <laughs> pi pilot purgatory, right? Getting stuck in an organization like yours, where I get really excited. I can tell everybody, man, I've got a deal. I've got an engagement yeah. with yeah. Anna Etna. It gives me so much credibility. Quite frankly, it strikes my e strikes my ego, strokes my ego. Um, and and but then, you know. Am I going to be engaged for two years, four years with no revenue coming in as we build, test, and iterate? You know, how do I structure that relationship to where it works for everyone? Yeah, that's the, I think, um, yeah, I think you have to be willing to accept a no sometimes. Mm -hmm. Why do I say that? Well, because it is critically important. Uh, you know, we're happy to, we're happy to do pilots all day long, free stuff. Sure. We'll, we'll put it out there. But if we don't define 
uh, what success is if we don't define what we're measuring and make sure that what we're measuring is important to the organization. Uh, and if we don't put a time limit on when we're going to measure that and uh, what it means and where we go when that happens, you know, it's purgatory. It really is. And enforcing all of those issues is uncomfortable. Uh, and it's like, oh my God, I'm going to lose the account. It's better to lose the account than to give away free stuff and go nowhere. Uh, and we've got some stuff that's in pilot purgatory right now. And, and uh, um, I, I keep asking the question, how do we know when, <laughs> when the pilot's over? <laughs> can answer that question? There's a problem. Yeah, exactly. How do we know when it's a success and yeah. how do we know when it's over, right? Oh and, my God. And what does that success tell us about the next stage in our relationship? You know, what's, what is the contract supposed to look like now? Okay, we hit the number you said we were supposed to hit. And when we hit that number, you promised that we were going to get at least a two-year contract and that here's what it was going to be structured like. Yep. That's yep. the kind of stuff you need to be talking about. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. Absolutely. <clears throat> um, so what advice do you have, kind of as we wrap up here, what advice do you have for, um, you know, systems like yourself that are trying to innovate within, um, you know, how, how are we working together as a community to move the needle? What do we need to do? Yeah, you know, my advice to systems like uh, like Banner uh, or Aetna or uh, CVS, frankly, is in order to nurture innovation, whether that's by partnership or internal development, you really need to separate out uh, a section of the company and say, I am going to protect this enclave of innovation. That, now, that doesn't mean they're, you know, uh, they've got free willy-nilly uh, license to do whatever or whenever, but they have to have sufficient autonomy. Mm -hmm. They are not held to task by the lean machine. Right. Yeah. That's a different function, right? And God bless them. They got to do that. Uh, there is nothing that I'm more passionate about than uh, driving variation out of care delivery uh, in healthcare, and that's a lean strategy. But that's not an innovation strategy, right? It, 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 so having that, and this is you know, Loom goes into this. Uh, uh, Loom shots goes into this too. Separating that group out, giving them some protection, and now that doesn't mean you ignore your lean team. You got you got to give both some love, right? And, and, and show them some, both some respect, but they have to have sufficient autonomy that they don't get cut the first time the budget gets, you know. Yeah, cut. absolutely. Separate budgets, separate yeah. processes and systems. Yeah. You know, just it's, it's like two separate organizations, separate cultures, yeah. right? That's exactly right. That's exactly <laughs> the culture right. of efficiency and productivity is not going to be conducive to yeah, birth yeah. new innovation. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And now I, I don't mean that it's willy nilly chaos over on the artist side, right? Right. About the term artist, uh, you have, one has to work within constraints and frankly, those constraints are what generate creativity. For example, uh, if I am going to uh, uh, put a thought out there uh, and somebody tells me that I have to do it in iambic pentameter, that's a constraint. But, you know, some of the greatest poetry ever written is written in iambic pentameter because that constraint existed. And the requirement was that here's your vehicle to express this thought. Um, and so it, it, it leads to uh, creativity, if you will, rather than stifling it. So mm -hmm. good. I, I, I like to think of uh, innovation in the context of uh, C-suites as uh, it, it really is corporate poetry, right? Mm -hmm. it's figuring mm -hmm. out how to accomplish meaningful work, meaningful innovation within the constraints that you uniquely have around whatever that topic is. Mm -hmm. You know, that's the challenge. It's not always possible. Sometimes the muse ain't there. But, you know, the other, other way of saying this is uh, I think Mark Twain was the one who said that I didn't have time to write you a short letter, so I wrote you a long one. <laughs> and that's another way of saying the same thing, right? It's, it's uh, 
creativity is not chaos. It is structured. Right. It is structured uh, in a way that allows you to, to think creatively about how you might accomplish it within that constraint. Yep, yep, absolutely. Okay, so then kind of flipping the hat a little bit, what advice do you have for health innovators? Hmm. That are in the trenches today. Yeah. Um, you know, the best, it, 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 it goes back to some advice that uh, I got a long time ago, and that is that almost everything starts with uh, relationships, human relationships. Absolutely. That's where ideas come from. That's where opportunity comes from. Uh, that's where uh, that's where the future of healthcare is going to come from. Uh, if you are a healthcare innovator, get to know your space. Uh, get to know what other innovations are out there in your space. Uh, get to know folks that are you know on the lean team uh, that are right. you know, making sure those processes iterate uh, like clockwork. Uh, expand your network, expand your connections. And through that process, you'll have more ideas, uh, you'll have uh, uh, more opportunities, and uh, happily more failures. Because the more failures you have, the closer you are to getting that one meaningful success that could drive your entire career. Absolutely. Awesome. So that's great wisdom. Thank you so much for sharing with our audience today. It's been a great discussion. I know that our listeners are going to get immense value from hearing this episode. Well, thank you, Roxy. That time went very quickly. That was a lot. <laughs> Thanks.